sponsored by Brilliant. I'm Rene Ritchie. Hit subscribe right now so you don't miss any of my WWDC 2020 deep dives like this, Mac OS on Apple Silicon. During the WWDC keynote, Tim Cook announced that just like Apple had previously transitioned the Mac from PowerPC to Intel processors, they'd now be transitioning it from Intel to Apple Silicon. That's right, Apple Silicon, not ARM, because Apple doesn't use ARM chip designs the way other companies do. They license the ARM instruction set for their own custom designs. So just like Steve Jobs never said PowerPC to x86, but PowerPC to Intel, and everyone recognized Intel from being inside Windows PCs, Tim Cook said Intel to Apple Silicon, which everyone will recognize from where they're inside, iPhones and iPads. Though I do kind of hope Phil Schiller and company come up with a slicker brand name at some point because PowerPC Mac or Intel Mac is just so much easier to say than Apple Silicon Mac. And they've used Fusion and Bionic for iOS generations in the past but I digress. While there are still a few more Intel Macs that are gonna ship, we're basically at the end of Core i5 or i7 or i9 processors being what powers the Mac. And at the beginning of something like the A series currently found in the iPad Pro just taking over. Back in June of 2005, Steve Jobs predicted the switch from PowerPC to Intel would start at the beginning of 2006 and finish by the end of 2007. And developers were given a cheese grater tower with a Pentium inside to help get their software going. In January of 2006, the first Intel Macs were announced, the 15 inch MacBook Pro and iMac. But Apple soundly beat their end goal by announcing the last Intel Macs, the Mac Pro and XServe, Wikipedia it by August of 2006, which was, yeah, way ahead of schedule. Tim Cook laid out a similar timeline for this Apple Silicon transition. Right now, developers can get a Mac mini with an Apple A12Z inside, the same chip currently powering the 2020 iPad Pro. The first Mac with Apple Silicon will ship by the end of the year, which some people have assumed will be an iPad-like ultralight MacBook, maybe a new 12 inch, and others have hoped would be an homage to the previous transition, either a MacBook Pro, iMac, or both. And also, just like before, the entire transition is expected to take two years, which while you never know what problems might arise, based on last time, sounds a little like Scotty's estimates from Star Trek at this point, because that's how you get your reputation as a miracle worker. It does imply though, that it's a complete transition. Again, same as before. And if so, maybe it completes the same way as well, with a new new Mac Pro and maybe iMac Pro at the very high end, at the end. Tim Cook did say that Apple still has some new Intel Macs in the pipeline as well, ones that they're really excited about, and that Apple will continue to release new versions of macOS beyond this year's macOS Big Sur and for years to come. By way of past being any form of prologue, the last version of macOS, then OS X, to support PowerPC was released in October 2007, just over two years after the transition was announced. PowerPC Macs reached vintage status in 2011, six years after the announcement, and obsolete status in 2013, eight years after, which is basically heat death of any and all support. So while it may not be safe to assume the Intel to Apple Silicon transition will be exactly the same, it is the only benchmark we have right now. When Steve Jobs explained the PowerPC to Intel transition a decade and a half ago, it all came down to this. There were Macs that Apple wanted to make, but simply couldn't make using what was currently available from PowerPC or what was on the PowerPC roadmap at the time. In explaining the Intel to Apple Silicon transition now, Tim Cook boiled it all down to the exact same thing. There are Macs that Apple wants to make and simply can't because of the current state of Intel Silicon and what's on Intel's roadmap going forward. Now, a big part of that is power per watt, or what some people call performance efficiency. Typically, the faster a chip goes, the more power it consumes and the more heat it generates. That means the speed is limited by the power in general and the heat in specific, especially when dealing with things like laptop sized enclosures. Back then, Intel was blowing the doors off of PowerPC when it came to performance per watt. These days, not so much. Intel has been massively, massively behind schedule when it comes to shrinking their dies down below 14 nanometers. They're just beginning to get 10 nanometer chips out the door right now. 
That's important because the smaller the process, the more efficient the chipset. You can either do a similar workload at less power or a higher workload at similar power. So where Intel used to be on a two year cycle, a tick for process shrink and a talk for architecture improvements, it's degenerated now into tick, talk, 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 optimize, optim, you get the idea. And to keep things moving, Intel went back to their old playbook and just threw cores at everything, which do improve performance, but at the cost of power and heat. So instead of MacBook Pros with smaller, more efficient chips in those tight aluminum enclosures, we have more hotter chips at Apple continuously having to work around them and forgive the pun, take heat for the thermals. And that's something you just never hear about with the iPad Pro, which has an even tighter aluminum enclosure and in some cases, way better performance. And which thanks to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing's process is already down to seven nanometers and probably going to five nanometers. And yeah, those are marketing terms, but they're also real process achievements. Apple's also managed to ship a new A series processor each year, every year right on schedule for the last decade, going to 64 bit, adding secure enclaves, switching to custom GPUs, adding neural engines, custom controllers, accelerators, and adding wider, more graphically powerful variants for the iPad. It's the difference between dependency and being in charge of your own destiny. I've said this before, but a bakery makes fresh bread every day, not because people shop every day, but because any day you decide to shop, you want that bread to be fresh. For years now, Intel just hasn't been able to ensure Mac customers get the best processors every year, any year they want to buy. But wow, howdy has Apple done that with the A-Series. And at scale, shipping billions of chips over the last decade, from tiny 10-core audio processors for our ears to the latest industry-leading, arguably industry-lapping A12Z and A13. And also for years now, Intel just hasn't been able to ship the features Apple wants to support. Things like 5K displays, Touch ID, and H.265 encoding. So hot damn, Apple put first an S series variant in the T1, and now more recently an A10 variant in the T2 into Macs just to provide custom timing controllers, storage controllers, secure elements, H.265 encode and decode blocks, and more. When Apple wanted to make Face ID for the iPhone, the silicon, software, and hardware teams worked together for years to make that happen. Integrated feature design like that simply wasn't possible for the Mac before and wouldn't even be possible if Apple stuck with x86 and delayed the transition for a few years by going AMD, at least for now, instead. With Apple Silicon though, it will be. And the same may be true with GPUs. Apple may use their own embedded custom GPUs in place of the Intel GPUs for now, but it's possible one day they're spinning boards like AMD and hopefully challenging Nvidia for the top spot. When it comes to silicon, Apple's biggest advantage is that they have only one customer, and that customer is willing to spend incredible amounts of money to get the best possible silicon imaginable. And yeah, that customer is Apple themselves. That wasn't clear. For companies like Intel, AMD, Qualcomm, they need to get paid by the chip, support multiple customers and their sometimes very different needs, and it's expensive. Qualcomm literally can't afford to make watch chips, and it's taken a while for AMD to be able to start funding GPUs that are competitive with Nvidia again. Apple though, doesn't care about making money on the chip. They make their money on the whole device, so they don't try to leave old technology on the shelf for as long as possible to recoup as much as possible. They kind of just tell their silicon team to run. In that context, Johnny Saruji, Apple's senior vice president of hardware technologies, said they're designing a family of SOCs, of systems on a chip for the Mac. SOCs are what Apple's been using for the iPhone and iPad since the introduction of the A4 a decade ago. No word yet on how many members will be in this SOC family, but it's not hard to imagine there'll be versions designed for ultra portable MacBooks, Pro MacBooks, desktops, and Pro desktops. And they'll have all the same silicon bells and whistles as the A series as well, including better embedded graphics, secure enclaves, neural cores, machine learning accelerators, cryptographic accelerators, audio cores, image signal processors, unified memory, display controllers, storage controllers, and what's been Apple's secret sauce for a long time now, performance controllers. There'll be no need for separate T2 chips anymore or to pay Intel's overhead, so it should result in better, simpler, and hopefully even less expensive Macs overall, at least in terms of the cost sunk into the silicon. What, if anything else, Apple decides to cram in there to take up that budget, who knows? On the Mac OS side, 
it should come as absolutely no surprise by now that the way in which Apple previously moved from PowerPC to Intel is broadly similar to how they'll be moving from Intel to custom Apple Silicon as well. On one hand, doing what works just makes the kind of sense that does. But on the other hand, I think it also reassures people that what worked before will work now. It's not Apple's first transition rodeo, more like their third or fourth now. First, there's Universal Binaries 2 in Xcode, Apple's developer environment, except this time, instead of PowerPC to Intel, they're Intel and Apple Silicon. Both during the keynote and the platform State of the Union presentation that followed, Apple stressed that many apps could get up and running in a matter of days, and even Adobe and Microsoft level complex apps in a matter of weeks. Apple's already done this with Universal Binaries 2 and their own apps, even pro apps like Final Cut Pro 10 and Logic 10, and they demoed Adobe and Microsoft apps already well on their way as well. Though I'd personally argue those two companies aren't the gatekeepers they used to be. Now that people use Google Docs in the browser and a variety of other Mac-specific image, video, and audio apps as well. Presumably, when Apple Silicon Macs ship, you'll just hit download in the Mac App Store and the right version for your chipset will just be installed. Same if you get your apps directly from the web. It'll just download and install the right version for your chipset. And yeah, because nothing is changing there either. The Apple Silicon Mac is the same as the Intel Mac. You can still get your apps from wherever you want. Second, there's Rosetta 2. For developers and apps that either won't or simply can't go native in a timely fashion, Rosetta 2 will let you launch Intel apps and run them on Apple Silicon through a combination of pre and at install time translation, and dynamically for just-in-time code like JavaScript, in a way that's meant to be utterly transparent. Apple showed off Maya, a high-end 3D software package, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, running on the A12Z, albeit aided by Metal. And it's really hard to tell anything from that yet. Presumably, people using Maya will be using far higher-end Macs and Apple Silicon than the iPad Pro chipset. And anyone wanting to game is gonna want a game just well beyond Shadow of the Tomb Raider and emulate it 1080p. Now, both high-end 3D work and high-end gaming have been brutal on the Mac for years already, with a lot of software either not supporting the Mac at all or testing the waters by offering only the barest possible support for as long as they feel like it, which is why most of that work and play is done on PCs. So worst case scenario, Apple Silicon is just the next step in Apple focusing on mainstream developer and video and audio pros. Best case, Apple is able to leverage the much bigger, more lucrative iPhone and iPad markets to expand the Mac at least somewhat back into more pro software and gaming, up to and including VR, which to date has been a non-story on the Mac, but is rumored to be something Apple's still very interested in. For this stuff though, time won't tell. The effort and evangelism Apple puts in with the studios is what'll tell. Third, there's virtualization. Apple's already announced a hypervisor framework and the silicon will literally be optimized for virtual machines. They also showed off both Docker and Parallels running on Apple Silicon. Now, so far, Apple has only shown ARM-based Linux distros, which is great for server nerds, but some people are legit worried about the future of Windows and Bootcamp on the Mac. That Apple didn't have anything to say about Windows this week is probably just down to partnerships being hard. There is Windows on ARM, but as most people would politely tell you, it's just not ready for prime time yet. But Parallels doesn't make its money off Linux. So my guess is there aren't any technical limitations in place. It's just down to working things out with all the players involved. As to Intel Windows and Intel Windows apps on Apple Silicon, that's probably the biggest wait and see in the cross-platform industry right now. For anyone immediately concerned though, Apple is still shipping and supporting Intel Macs for the next few years. Fourth, and completely new to this transition, iPhone and iPad apps on the Mac. Basically, iPhone and iPad apps already run Apple Silicon natively, so they can run natively unmodified on Apple Silicon Macs. With zero effort, they run in a window. If an iPad app has added support for things like size classes and multiple instances, then those windows can resize and they can get multiple windows on the Mac. Likewise, if they support Apple frameworks like dark mode, that just works as well. In other words, a great iPad app will be a decent iPad app on the Mac, right off the iPad app store. Of course, going in and doing the extra work of turning it into a Catalyst app, which is Apple's name for UIKit apps on the Mac, could turn it into a full-on Mac app as well. And that's one of the biggest benefits of Apple going all in on a shared architecture across all of their platforms. Suddenly, all of those apps are just available on the Mac.
The biggest downside, of course, is gonna be the impact on the nature of the Mac itself. And that's gonna affect the same people who've been affected by every mass market and maximum control oriented change Apple's made to the Mac since the advent of the iPhone. So yeah, step by step, a lot of what some traditional computer users loved about OS X has been transformed into what they hate about iOS, or at least what they hate about iOS in the context of what they believe should be an open computing environment like OS X. Apple, though, has inextricably, implacably, undeniably continued to push their computing into that increasingly mainstream-centric direction, which is why people with MacBooks also have gaming PCs and pros with iMacs also have Linux boxes or PC render farms. They're absolutely not fine with that. They want Apple to do everything, high-end gaming and high-end graphics, all of it, because they love Apple. And who knows, maybe that'll change. Maybe Apple will address all of those needs, but my guess is not. For people who want to do everything Apple already doesn't do well, you'll have to increasingly do that on other platforms. But for people who love and use everything Apple, the Mac moving to Apple Silicon will be even better overall and give them even more on the Mac to love. So for early adopters itching for bleeding edge Apple Silicon Macs and living that Apple life, depending on which exact Mac you're itching for, there's only half a year to wait at a minimum, maybe two years at a maximum. And for pros desperate to keep their production environment stable and predictable, again, depending on which exact Mac you're using, there's at least a couple of years of new operating systems, several years of software support, and over a half a decade of hardware support still ahead of you. And for anyone that's change adverse for any reason, any Intel Mac you just bought or you just buy now is still more than fine. And by the time you have to decide on your next computer, you'll have a ton of real world data to base that decision on and a ton of time to do the math, especially if you check out Brilliant's new complete math course. Yeah, I did that. It lets you brush up on fundamentals, probability, algebra, calculus, trigonometry, differential equations, and geometry, all the math for school, for work, for fun, for figuring out your next Mac. Brilliant is a problem solving based website and app with a hands-on approach with over 60 interactive courses in math, in science and in computer science. Courses that can help you achieve your goals in STEM, starting with one small commitment to learning and building up to long-term challenges and growth. Go to brilliant.org slash Rene and sign up for free. And the first 200 of you can also level up with 20% off your annual premium subscription. Thanks Brilliant. Thanks to all of you for your support. Check out the WWDC playlist right there and see you next video.